All right, welcome everybody. Uh, today we have Dr. Mo or Melissa Hagman, um, who comes to us from her work at Harborview, and we're really pleased to have her with us. She's the Assistant Professor of Internal Medicine and of Hospice and Palliative Care at the University of Washington. She splits her time between inpatient general medicine ward attending, inpatient palliative care consultation, and resident education. She is the Internal Medicine Residency Associate Program Director for Curriculum. She received her Doctorate of Medicine at the University of Washington. She was named one of the best doctors in America for 2009-2010, uh, she was in, uh, mentioned in Seattle Magazine Top Docs three times. She's a fellow of the American College of Physicians. She received the University of Washington Dr. Paul Beeson Award and was awarded by House Staff for Excellence in Teaching 2006. She received the University of Washington Service Excellent Award, Excellence Award in 2005. Her current research interests are in resident education procedural skills, and in palliative care. Dr. Hagman, thank you so much for speaking to us on palliative care. Thank you, Sharon. I appreciate the kind introduction. The information I got to come speak to you guys said, could you write a couple sentences about yourself? It had none of that in there. <laughs> um, it said something like, I harass residents, Sharon it to education, um, and it had nothing about the awards that they've since rescinded from me because they realized they made improper uh, decisions in the first place. Um, I feel like uh, probably palliative care and psychiatry should be speaking to each other more often. Um, I feel like we should almost have a support group. Um, at the University of Washington, when I come on the floor, I do 90% general internal medicine, 10% palliative care. If I go on to certain floors in the hospital, so if I come off of the medicine unit, maybe wander to the oncology unit, there's often a gasp that goes up, and the nurses will just sort of track me, and they'll be like, which room are you going into? And I'm like, I'm just seeing a medicine patient, off-service medicine patient up here on the floor, and they all sigh with relief. So the death doctor isn't going in to see their patient there. And, and they're some of our biggest advocates at the University of Washington are the oncology nurses. And so the fact that even they gasp when I come on the floor um, leaves me with a sense, I, I feel like my dentist. I told my dentist he did a really great job when he did this oral surgery for me recently, and he said, well, it's really good to know. Do you know that there have been studies that dentists die sooner than other doctors because nobody wants to go see their dentist? Nobody wants to go see their palliative care doctor. And I'm guessing you guys have a similar situation that nobody wants to necessarily either be seen at a psychiatrist or be seen uh, by a psychiatrist. So maybe we should have all subspecialties that start with P support groups. I have no uh, financial relationships to disclose. I usually show my car, um, which is a 91 Nissan Sentra that's been totaled, and you can pay $18 to get your totaled car retitled and continue to drive it, just so you know. At least it was $18 two years ago when it was last totaled. Um, not through my own fault. My driving record is sound. Um, occasionally drunk drivers hit me at 2 o'clock in the morning when I'm going back from the university. All right, we're going to talk uh, this afternoon about uh, what is palliative care, just to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of a definition, uh, what patients and families can potentially expect from a palliative care consult. We'll talk a little bit about holding on to hope, because uh, another one of the things that people think uh, sometimes about palliative care is that we come and we suck all the hope out of a room. Um, and then ways that we can potentially work together to reduce patient and family anxiety both uh, before a loved one dies and, and afterwards. So at the risk of not knowing what this group usually does and not knowing if you're interactive or not, I'm going to try this and then if it fails miserably, we will not do it again. But would somebody like to stick their neck out and say what they, if somebody asked them what was, what is palliative care, could we try a definition, knowing that it's very hard to define and any definition you give is probably adequate. Um, comfort yes. Care. Comfort care. Pain, care. Pain. Pain relief. That's, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Comfort. Okay, provide comfort. Is anybody thinking kill them, kill them all? No? Okay, good, thank you. <laughs> Death panels? No? Yes? 
May, may not. Thank you for saying may not. Sometimes a cure accidentally happens, um, despite our best efforts. No, that's not true. But um, yes, cure does sometimes happen, but that may not be our focus. Good. I think those are all, all reasonable things. Um, thank you, again, for not saying that we're death panel doctors or everybody dies. When I put up definitions of palliative care, I feel almost a little bit hokey. Um, when I'm trying to explain to patients and families what we do, I also feel a little bit hokey. Um, I often will say, you know, if you just had sore throat, you wouldn't be seeing us. So in general, palliative care folks take care of folks who have some sort of serious illness. Um, we might be interested in comfort-based care in somebody who has a sore throat, right? We might check to see if they have strep throat and give them something, a throat lozenge, to help them be more comfortable while they get better. Uh, but nobody's going to call a palliative care consultant to do that. That would just be sort of overkill. So folks need to have some sort of advanced and generally incurable um, illness, whether that's one that's going to um, take their life in 10 years or one that might take their life in 10 days. And then I think in general palliative care, like you guys were saying, tries to help patients and we lump the families. And when I say families today, I mean anybody that the patient identifies as family. So that could be the neighbor across the street, that could be the beloved dog, that could be somebody who lives in uh, Bermuda that they've only met twice. Um, whoever they define, I'm just going to call them family. Okay? So we help patients and families together uh, live the best life possible in the setting of incurable advanced illness. So not necessarily comfort care per se, which I think if you say comfort care to an ICU nurse or a critical care physician is something where we stop the ventilator and somebody dies shortly thereafter, but something just whatever is the best life for you, dear patient, dear family, let's try to achieve that. And let's use whatever tools we have in our arsenal to help that happen. Palliative care also, like you said, um, you, you said pain uh, management. We lump sort of symptoms in general, just trying to help uh, control them. And then tagging along what you said about not tr necessarily trying to cure, we may try to treat the symptom without necessarily being able to treat the underlying cause um, of the symptom. And then we like to say that we're a team approach sort of group. Um, and uh, the best reminder I had of that recently was I was uh, doing a consult at the university on a Saturday, and a family had, you know, there were three sisters who had flown in from out of town, and the parents had flown from out of town, and there was a, like an Uber aunt there, and I arrived as just me. And they said, where's the team? I said, she said, we were told we were going to see the palliative care team. I'm like, well, it's Saturday at 4 p.m., here I am. Um, and they chuckled, thank goodness, because uh, there was no team on Saturday. So maybe we value teams only Monday through Friday. I'm not entirely sure. All right. And anybody who thinks about palliative care, um, I think this is sort of shifting. But when I walk up onto the oncology floor, the nurses are thinking that this is me. I'm this black line between the patients who are getting some sort of cure-based therapy, and when I walk in their room, death follows shortly thereafter. Uh, the model that we're moving towards, and I think um, even in the short time that I've been doing palliative care, I've seen a move to is one where uh, you can be getting cure-based therapy and seeing a palliative care doctor who's helping with symptom management or quality of life issues. Um, you could throw a psychiatrist in there who's helping with other issues. You could sh uh, throw in the dentist who needs some morale boosting as well. Um, so everybody's sort of working together. And that as somebody's illness becomes less curable, the palliative care uh, team might have more to do with the care, but we could be part of the care early on um, and still be of help. So the best study in my mind that has ever been done in palliative care, and not necessarily by best in terms of rigor, but best in terms of the outcome was better than any palliative care doctor could have ever hoped for, and I'm nervous that they're going to try to repeat this and we're not going to get the same answer, and then we're going to be hosed. So here we go. <laughs> the folks um, in Boston uh, took 151 uh, ambulatory folks, so they were walking into the clinic, they were ECOG status at least two, they were spending at least more than 50% of their day out of bed. They had recently been diagnosed with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, which in general um, carries a life expectancy of about nine months. So these were people who were relatively well at the time of diagnosis, but likely had a reasonably short life expectancy. And what they said is we're going to randomize you either to continuing to see the oncologist group, and the oncologist can do whatever they want, including refer to palliative care if that's what they want. And about 14% of the folks in that arm ended up being referred to palliative care as part of normal routine oncologic care. 
versus we're going to let you still see your same old oncologist. They can do whatever they want. But in addition, you must suffer through the torture of a once a month meeting with a palliative care team member. On average, the folks who are randomized to the palliative care with oncology care simultaneously received anywhere between zero to eight visits, and the median was four. So maybe only four visits on average with a palliative care uh, provider, whether that was the physician, the nurse practitioner, the PA, the a chaplain, um, a social worker, it didn't matter, um, somebody on the team saw them. So then they looked at two outcomes. The one that they were hoping going into the study would show a difference was quality of life. So at 12 weeks, uh, quality of life for the folks who had been randomized to palliative care with uh, cure-based oncology care um, was better. So the folks who saw a palliative care team member had higher quality of life based on the functional assessment of cancer therapy lung scale. They also had fewer depressive symptoms, which seemed also something that they were hoping they were going to find based on the hospital anxiety and depression scale. Uh, and folks also received less aggressive end-of-life care. And by aggressive end-of-life care, um, did they die in an intensive care unit where they referred to hospice less than three days before they died. Those were the sorts of things that counted as aggressive care. But the surprise to the oncologists and to the palliative care doctors, I think, is that the folks who were randomized to the palliative care with oncology care arm lived, and I'm going to exaggerate just a bit, almost three months longer than the folks who were just seen by the oncologists. So this was like, oh my goodness, we don't kill them quicker data. Um, and this is what I use now um, if I'm looking at a neurosurgeon, if I'm looking at a general medicine person, if I'm looking at a family medicine person, I'm now using it for you guys as psychiatrists, um, at least in Boston area, metastatic non-small cell lung cancer patients, we don't kill them quicker and they might be happier and live longer. Three months, you might say, not a big deal. Three months, a great big deal if all you were going to live was nine months to begin with. So it's a third again as long as you're going to live. A relatively good deal. Quality and length. I use, not in that detail, but I use that same discussion uh, with family members who are saying, oh my goodness, you can't go in and see my loved one. They, they will, that, that's it. They're just going to give up and they're going to die. I'm like, listen, maybe they'll live as third as long. I don't know, but this could be, this could be grand. And looking at the intervention, I said that um, in these Boston patients with lung cancer, they met with a palliative care team member um, on, a on average about four times before they died. Uh, this is what happened at the initial palliative care visit um, in that study. This was sort of a, a second publication uh, that came out of it. it the, the meeting took about an hour. They talked mostly about symptom management. They also talked about patient and family coping. Um, and what the patient and family's understanding of their illness was. So not rocket science, um, and something that I think most of us uh, could do. But they were not encumbered by trying to figure out whether the chemotherapy for the metastatic non-small cell lung cancer was working, or whether their, the MRI for the brain was due next. They had an hour to sit and talk about how are you doing, and how are you feeling, and what's important to you. All right, so I'm going to extrapolate a little bit from my experience with my psychiatry inpatient consult colleagues at the university. Um, and I often have a hard time trying to figure out if I have a patient on medicine or a palliative care patient that I'm seeing, how do I open the door to that patient and family to get a psychiatrist in without making it sound like, you know, lots of people still think I still am blessed every morning when I wake up not in a straight jacket. I think, my goodness, they haven't found me yet, um, and I'm still okay. But how do I introduce a psychiatry consult to a palliative care family or to a general medicine uh, uh, family or patient? Um, and so I think you guys might be in a similar situation. How, if you were seeing somebody, how do you think you might introduce us as well. And so what can a patient or family expect if they were to see a palliative care doctor? And I think this is in general if they were to see these folks who were in the Boston study or if they were to see us over at the university or if they were to see the folks here at Harborview or wherever you might be practicing, I think we're relatively similar. Symptom management, as you mentioned, um, when I asked sort of about the definition of palliative care, some sort of goals of care discussion. Are we on track? Are you getting what you need from the medical surgical community? And patient and family support. So again, it worked before, you were interactive before. If you're going to introduce, you're going to tell the patient you're seeing, geez, I think uh, a 
palliative care consult might be helpful to you, um, how might you do that? And again, there's 1,200 ways to do this. None of them are particularly wrong unless you say, I heard they're having death panels. I'd like you on it. <laughs> yes, Sharon. I'm going to the Boise VA. There's a vacancy at the university. Please come work with us. So again, just in case the folks who remotely couldn't hear Sharon because she's a little away from the microphone, uh, she mentioned not soft pedaling around things, um, emphasizing life, uh, not death, um, and saying perhaps uh, it would be reasonable for you to speak to somebody who specializes in this. Yes. Well, I had a, a somewhat different take with the same content, but the kind of a procedure thing. Depends on who's asking. If I, as a psychiatrist, were, were to introduce this, uh, as opposed to say, an intern that's taken care of, I think it'd be very important that the primary care team had introduced the topic that this is a serious, maybe end of life sort of issue. They probably don't want to hear from somebody else, oh, by the way, I think for all the right reasons said very nicely, it's time to be talking about end of life care if the patient doesn't even know they have a terminal illness or something like that. So that would be kind of, I think, a very fortunate intervention. Yes, in palliative care, we call that jumping on the grenade. And it's not necessarily something we like to do. The grenade, you just pulled the pin. Right, exactly, the right, exactly. The um, unfortunateness of uh, somehow they haven't heard, whether it's been mentioned or not, they haven't heard, the family or patient haven't heard the severity of their illness, um, and we assume that they have, and then the grenade explodes and we're on top of it. So, agreed. Um, it's nice if, if they know ahead of time. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, the way that we get around that in palliative care. Uh, it's a little tricky because we come in introducing ourselves as palliative care doctors is by simply asking the patient or family what their understanding of their situation is. If the first thing that the patient said or family says to us is, I'm dying, doc, then we can kind of cut to the chase and sort of say this is something they're, they're willing to talk about. Um, if they say, uh, you know, the, the chemotherapy and the radiation or the... Um, the left ventricular assist device um, that I'm getting on Tuesday is going to save my life and I'm going to live, you know, 40 more years, then, then maybe we need to, to work on their understanding of their illness before we start talking about their quality of life. Good. Um, so I had something much, uh, much simpler and less elegant than what uh, Sharon recommended. Uh, it's common at the university folks to say there's a group called the palliative care team who works hand in hand. Again, we're not separate, we're part of. Uh, the other members of your healthcare team to help understand what is important to you and how all the members of the healthcare team can work together to maximize your quality of life. Sounds a little bit like social work, sounds a little bit about like psychology, I don't know, but it sort of, it works for us. Um, and then oftentimes we'll have primary teams say, I would like the palliative care team to come by, almost as if they're doing us a favor, um, would that be okay? So we get a lot of confusion about, is palliative care hospice? and what's the difference? So I like to use the analogy of, of facial tissue. Palliative care is like a box of generic facial tissue. And hospice is like Kleenex brand. You get a certain set of things with hospice and palliative care is a little bit more generic, okay? So just very briefly, because I'm sure most of you are familiar with, um, with hospice, uh, the kickers with hospice that make it more sort of Kleenex brand is uh, the federal government, uh, since usually they're paying for it, or insurers, because they usually follow the, what the federal government has set as a lead, needs somebody um, who's a physician to say, if this person's primary illness runs its natural course, I would anticipate that they would not be alive in six months. Um, you can get palliative care without having that be 
uh, the case. However, a hospice, that needs to be the general thing. It's often a barrier to patients and families being willing to go on to hospice because somehow uh, they think, if, if somebody thinks I only have six months, somehow they think we're better than we are at guessing in the first place. Um, the folks down in Oregon published a study in the last six months where they simply, every time they saw a palliative care consult patient, they made a firm guess on how long that person had to live, and they were like correct and these were broad categories, you know, three days, weeks, three to six months, six months to a year, and they're only right about 58% of the time. So we're really bad guessers, which is also comforting to patients. I'll say, you know what, in general, we're bad guessers, so let's try the hospice thing. And when you live 12 months, 18 months, four years, that's fine. Um, hospice doesn't usually kick people off unless they're completely cured or something miraculous happens, and then what a great deal. You can get off of hospice, um, and that's, uh, that's good. So if you are on hospice, if you're getting Kleenex brand physicians, we emphasize folks get to keep their physicians. They can keep their psychiatrist as one of their subspecialists, um, and they usually inherit a hospice medical director, which they probably will never meet. Um, a nurse who comes at least once a week and is available 24-7 by phone, which is, I think, in, in my patient population, the best deal with hospice. Uh, uh, a certified nursing assistant, a CNA, who comes twice a week to help with things like um, painting toenails, changing bed sheets, taking baths, talking about car races, whatever sort of needs to be done. A social worker, um, a chaplain. Um, and uh, an army of volunteers. I usually tell my patients, if you can dream up something you'd like somebody else to do, ask them. They might have a volunteer who does it. The unique benefits of hospice, again, that don't necessarily come with palliative care, 24-hour um, on-call nurse availability, like I talked about, spiritual support, which is hard to get, um, and other things, and it almost makes me laugh that the federal government has mandated spiritual care be part of Medicare paid for hospice. I'm like separation of church and state, we're firm in some places, and then we mandate it in other places, whatever, okay. Um, easy access to equipment and medications, I love the fact, machine for narcotic prescriptions for hospice patients. It's delightful, they don't have to come see me to get it, I can call them in over the phone, um, I've almost forgotten how to write a real prescription for a narcotic because most of my patients are on hospice now when I'm writing for narcotics and it's grand. Medications will be delivered to them, which is a great relief to many of them, it's fantastic. Uh, they get comprehensive emotional and grief support from social workers, the spiritual care person on the team, volunteers, their special programs in most hospices for kids which are, are grand, especially for somebody like me, who when I started doing um, palliative medicine, I'm like, oh, you have a child. And then I, like, all the blood would drain out of my face, and I'd almost faint. I'd be like, uh, this shouldn't happen to people who have children, and that's not a very professional response for me to have, but that was about the extent of what I thought people should be doing with children um, when they were dying. I had no clue. Um, but there are people to help with that. And then the other thing that brings great... Uh, helps relieve anxiety in many patients is the knowledge that the hospice team will continue to follow their loved ones for a year um, after they die, if they want it. Um, they, and they can be as involved or not involved. They can attend camps for kids in the summer, um, uh, support groups, or they can simply shred the flyer that comes in the mail once a month um, and never have any bereavement support um, beyond the therapy of shredding paper. Hospice light, anybody familiar with hospice light? It's like generic facial tissue with a K, not the Kleenex, just the K of the Kleenex. Um, it happens usually in larger hospices. So for example, in the Seattle area, both Evergreen and Providence have, um, they call it different things. Providence calls it their transitions program. Evergreen calls it their palliative care program, which gets very confusing. Um, but they are free services uh, provided to patients who don't meet the six month, I think you might die, or they're not interested in hospice for some other reason, uh, but they can get either a nurse, a chaplain, a social worker, or a combination of those three people who will check in at least by phone periodically to say things like, how are we doing? Are we still on track with the goals? Oh, oh, your primary caregiver has fallen and broken her hip. Oh, how are we going to take care of that? Those sorts of things. And then it sort of helps ease folks if they're thinking they might do hospice in the future, but they're not ready for it at the time. This is sort of a, an easier transition. Uh, the, two, uh, the two groups here in Seattle are uh, grant and donation funded, um, and so many of the larger cities in the U.S. have similar programs. Um, and then, unfortunately, places uh, that are a little bit smaller, not so much.
but it's worth asking about um, where you're living. All right, so patients and families can expect um, from a palliative care consult symptom management discussions, goals of care discussions, patient and family support. And symptom management, we talk a lot, a lot, but I want to talk a little bit about goals of care. This is um, my, the reason why I will never become a full professor, nor do I aspire to become a full professor. It's because when I think of things that could be added to the medical literature, I come up with acronyms like PUSHER. Can you imagine, <laughs> I'm a palliative care doctor, and every time I go into a patient's room, I use the PUSHER method. They're like, oh my goodness, you're sending them to the death panel. But pusher helps me remember um, the things that I'm going to usually talk with the patient or family about, at least on the first visit. And so if you are, uh, um, if one of your patients is receiving a palliative care consult, again, I think they might get this general flavor of questions asked of them. Uh, before I go in the room, I try to figure out who the people are. Is the patient able to talk to me? Who's the legal decision maker if the patient's unable to? Who else um, does the patient count as family or important folks who need to be part of the decision making or the discussion? Um, I almost cry, sob, when we have great discussions with patients. They say all these things that are important to them and how they want to live the rest of their life, and there's nobody from the family there to hear it. It's like, oh, where's the tape recorder? Um, so we usually try to have other folks in the room other than the patient um, and the member of the palliative care team. Once we sort of have an outline of who the people are, uh, like I mentioned earlier, often our first question is, what is your understanding of your situation? Gives us an idea of where they're at. Um, we refrain from what happens more when I have my medicine hat on, or I might say, and the CAT scan showed this, and your echo showed this, and your blood pressure this morning was this, and I'd like to tell you more and more and more about you. Um, a lot of just listening to what their understanding is, and not necessarily unless there are gross misconceptions, correcting them at this point in the discussion. I then ask, uh, wow, given the situation you're in, what gives you strength? That's where we hear about God, the dog, um, the people next door, um, I, the Tibetan singing bowl, I kid you not. Mm -hmm. I think there was a woman at the University of Washington when I was a three-year-old attending um, who believes she was saved by her Tibetan singing bowl, and I have no other plausible explanation, so I'm going with it too. <laughs> Tibetan singing bowl saved. Um, the, who knows? I thought it was annoying, but um, there we go. The rest of the people on the floor, thank goodness, thought it was great because the rest of the patients could hear it as well. All right, fourth question is usually, um, given your situation, what are you hoping for? Um, what are you concerned about? Um, and I often get a blank stare from patients about what are they hoping for. They look at me like, you numbskull. I am hoping for whatever this horrible thing is to go away. And I'm like, yes, yes. I say, that is plan A. Plan A is this all just goes away. What about if plan B happens? What are you hoping for for plan B? And then usually they can kind of come up with something. But I want to talk for a moment about hope um, in case you run into the things that I do where people think we suck the hope out of the room. So uh, Randy Curtis here at Harborview and his colleagues, uh, most of them again here at Harborview, um, asked the question of how do patients, how do they sort of coexist with the reality of their prognosis and the hopes that they might have? Um, as you would suspect, because Randy is a pulmonologist, the patients in the study had COPD, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary lung disease, or advanced uh, lung malignancy. And they interviewed both the patients and the families. And they came up with four general patterns of hope and how people could live um, and exist with their, prog their poor prognosis and some sort of form of hope. So there were the folks who went back and forth. Oh, it's all horrible. I'm doomed. There's nothing to be hopeful for. Oh, this is this will be fine. I'll be okay. I'm hopeful. They made it through. It's okay. Um, but you'll meet some of those people, and we just sort of need to realize that that's the kind of people they are. Okay. Um, then there are the scales, folks. Give me a little bit of bad news. Okay, that's all I can take because I've got to keep it okay with my hope. So a little bit of bad news. Um, and these folks who are the scales folks, um, their scales fall apart if somebody walks in and drops uh, the grenade uh, on one of their scales. Uh, so sometimes they're better getting information, little bits, so they can sort of, not, not incorrect information, but maybe being careful with the size of the grenade um, that we launch on them. And then there are the yin and yang folks, who I'm going to over-exaggerate just a bit, but they know that things are bad, 
but they're still very cheery. So you can have, these are the folks that I'm called to see where the primary team will tell me um, this person has no idea they're dying. They're just too hopeful. And I'll go in and I'll say, what's your understanding? And they'll say, I'm dying. And I'll come out of the room and I'll say, well, no, they, they just told me they're dying. They're okay. But they're, like, but they're, they're talking about their son's graduation that's two years from now. They're not going to live that long. I'm like, they know they're dying. They're just talking about the graduation. So folks who can live with perhaps some understanding and a little bit of unrealistic expectations, but that's how they put their hope and their prognosis uh, understanding together. And then uh, the folks who are able to redirect their hope. Okay, I'm not going to live to be 164. Um, my heart failure is not going to go away. Um, and so I'm going to hope for other things. And I want to show you a video um, by Tony Bach, who's one of the oncologists at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. He and a slew of smart people, including Kelly Fryer Edwards from the UW, um, have the OncoTalk website that they use for um, helping to teach folks how to break bad news. And they have a video that I'd like to share with you about talking with folks about hope. Um, the particular actor that's in the video um, has been told that, he, that his prostate cancer has recurred, and he'll take it from there. Dr. Bach is the one who looks like the doctor without the prostate cancer, and the other one looks like the patient. An actor. Is there, uh, is there any hope? Well, so, you know, there are all kinds of things we hope for. I mean, what, what, what comes through your mind when you think about hope? Well, I mean, uh, I've got a few things coming up that I hope I can still be around for, you know? Yeah, like what? Well, you know, I have a grandson graduating from high school. Uh -huh. I'd, like to, I'd like to go there, see that. Uh, right about that time, uh, my alpacas, you know, start to have babies. Alpacas! Uh, it's always a great time, you know, when you got a barnyard full of little babies running around having fun. And, California. And I'd, I'd like to see uh, some of that, if you can you can swing that for me. Well, you know, I think those are some hopes that we could really work on. So, of course, I'm going to be working on the cancer, too. But, you know, I always feel like it's good for us to have a whole bunch of things to hope for. Well, I've, you know what, on the farm there's always stuff going on. There's, I mean, you're in one season or another. So I'm always going to have stuff to hope for. So I use this video for, for two reasons. I mean, think of, think of all the great information he's just given you for future return visits, right? And who would have ever come up with he wants to see the alpacas being born, right? So if, as a palliative care doctor or psychiatrist who has this sort of information, if we can share with an oncologist or a heart failure doctor or whomever is the primary team treating this person's underlying severe illness, if we, when I look at an oncologist in the eyes and I say, listen, the alpaca babies are being born, and they look at me like I've lost my mind. They call you guys, you carry me away. I get released, I come back. I say, no, 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 the alpacas are important. Um, this guy's wondering how your chemotherapy, your radiation, your left ventricular assist device is going to help him see the alpaca babies. I guess they're born in the spring. I don't know when alpacas are born. Um, but I mean, that's a different sort of, that's a palliative care frame of mind for treatment rather than a, um, well, we can, you can, we can take your prostate out, we can give you radiation, we can do this, we can do that. Um, now we can do those things, but maybe we can do them with the goal of the son, grandson who's graduating and the alpaca babies. What a great chart note that makes, right? Mm -hmm. Waiting for the alpaca babies. All right. Um, so push your acronym. Uh, we've gone through hopes and fears. Um, you guys probably know this much better than I do because you get much better training and you spend much more time talking to people than I do. Um, but um, I have learned not to ask gentlemen what they are fearful of. 
because they never are afraid of anything. So you have to come up with some other sort of term. Um, and sometimes I duck it by saying, what is your family worried about? Um, and then they'll eventually get around to it. And I'm sorry for making gross male-female sort of generalizations, but I have stepped on the grenade of asking a gentleman what he's fearful of more than once. And, and if I could spare you that, um, that'd be great. The next question we ask in the PUSHER acronym is usually what are your experiences with past illness or family members with past illness? Um, the best example I can give you is that there was a woman who I was asked to see. Um, she was in her 80s um, and she was distraught uh, that she had been unable to flip her husband over. He had collapsed in a door jam at home. He was now in the intensive care unit and they were concerned that he um, was neurologically devastated as a result of his uh, cardiac arrest at home. She had been, she just kept telling me, I couldn't get him flipped over. I do CPR training every six months. I couldn't get him flipped over. If I could have flipped him over. And I'm thinking, what 80 year old woman does CPR training every six months? Um, and I just didn't say anything because I had no idea what I, she might as well have said alpacas for all I could tell. Um, and it came out that when we were then talking about a, a, a meeting we were putting together, that her daughter had coded the daughter's husband twice at home and that that husband was coming to the family meeting later that afternoon. So the family's experience was that two out of three codes in the family resulted in complete recovery and he was coming to the family meeting. So you can imagine if I had met with them and said, you know, geez, 80 years is a good run at it and codes don't go well in general, they'd be like, what are you talking about? This guy's been coded twice by this lady who's sitting right here and our family is super coders. Um, it, it, it would have not been necessarily the best thing. So trying to understand what other people's experiences have been in the past. And then only after we sort of have understood what's important, what they're worried about, what they're hopeful for, what gives them strength, then making a recommendation, um, you need to see a psychiatrist, I can't help you. Nobody thought that was funny. Okay, we're moving on. That's usually not the recommendation we make, but um, only after we understand the patient's story do we then make a, uh, a recommendation about something. Maybe, um, our, I think our most common recommendation is, how about if you take Tylenol four times a day? Makes me feel really good as a doctor. But, but if I've heard the alpaca story, I can carry on. All right, I want to shift gears a little bit for maybe about 10 minutes, and then I'll stop for questions. Um, talking a little bit about some of the data we have, um, which in palliative care is all pretty much soft data, about how what we do either before or after a patient dies can affect uh, the anxiety level of either the patient um, or the family members. And uh, I should never give a disclaimer when I'm speaking, but I'm going to. When I say anxiety, I mean sort of in the non generalized anxiety disorder, so let my general internist self please forgive me for being non-psychiatrically trained. So four things that I think we can do that can help. Um, letting patients and families do most of the talking, um, which again I think you guys are probably already very good at. Dignity therapy, which we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, advanced directives, which makes me want to poke my eyeballs out, but I'll show you some data that they're helpful. And then letters of condolence. I'll get on my soapbox for about three seconds um, about letters of condolence. So I'm guessing in psychiatry training, there's all sorts of things about just let the person talk and direct them and that sort of thing. Um, it works in palliative care um, and other things. Uh, John McDonough, uh, working here with, again, with Randy Curtis, I uh, did a study in the ICU that patients and families, um, like their physicians, thought the communication was better um, if they talked more than the physician or other healthcare provider did. And it didn't really matter how long you were in the room or how long the discussion was, as long as they talked more than you, it was a better deal. Um, and then I want to show you the LaTret study from 2007 that talks again about ICU patients, uh, but how the, the, the mechanism that we use to talk with them may make things easier on the survivors after the patient's death. The LaTrette folks used um, the value strategy. Again, I think PUSHER is a much better acronym, but they went with value. Um, and they, they tried to teach ICU uh, communicators to value family statements, acknowledge their emotions. By the way, I should, let me tie the emotions and the Kleenex boxes together real quick, and I, I'll do two soap boxes. I think if I stand, I'll throw the gentleman with the camera off, so I won't, but Kleenexes. So here's the, the palliative care mantra on Kleenexes, right? You're having a discussion, somebody breaks down crying. What do they teach you guys in psychiatry to do with a crying person? 
Because maybe this is, maybe we're weird in palliative care. Give them Kleenex. Give them Kleenex. Don't touch them. Don't touch them. Is that the general? Fair enough. In the palliative care, when I'm in with residents or students, it's like a Chinese fire drill has happened most of the time when somebody starts starts um, crying. There is like a clamor to be the first person to find the Kleenex box. And I swear, if there's none within reach, they will go out, they will manufacture them and bring them back. Um, and then the whole spirit of the moment is sort of lost. So I, I am a believer in the back of the sleeve. I'm from Idaho. Um, and if the Kleenex box, in my opinion, is not reachable um, by the patient, then don't bust up the moment, in my opinion. Let them just cry. It's okay. It Validate that it's normal. Maybe pause for a moment. Why do we not want to touch them? We're psychiatrists. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I'm not a psychiatrist. Oh. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the training that I've had is you don't touch it because you don't want to break the moment. Okay. Them, you break the moment. Gotcha. Okay. Sure. I thought like get cooties or something, but yes, you don't want to break the moment. So the same, the same yeah. mantra. Like yeah. let, let it, let them go. It, they've reached some place emotionally that's probably good for them to be. So, so let it go. So, for if the students in the room don't go get the Kleenex box, and you will not fail the rotation even if you don't get the Kleenex box. All right, so acknowledging emotions, listening to the patient, understanding the patient as a person, simply asking, you know, tell me more about this person before they were in the ICU, um, and asking if the family has any questions. Um, in this law study, uh, 126 patients, they're mostly studying the family members, not the patients. Um, they called a family member 90 days after the patient had died. Uh, the, ran the intervention was that after three family meetings, so that's already a lot of more family meetings than most folks get in the ICU, they randomized folks to either continuing this usual scheme of communication or then future family meetings being based on this value-based communication style. Plus they got a bereavement brochure which I'm sure is what did the trick. <laughs> they probably should have given the bereavement brochure to both sides because now we can't tell if it was the value communication or the brochure, but, and you laugh, I'm gonna show you a video study where videos made all the difference. I'm not sure for the better. Anyway, the folks who had the value strategy type family meetings later on, um, as defined by the physicians and the healthcare team, those patients refused, or sorry, received fewer non-beneficial interventions, which it shouldn't be the goal necessarily of the care, but the folks, um, the survivors had fewer symptoms of PTSD based on the impact of event scale and less anxiety and depression symptoms um, based on the hospital anxiety and depression scale um, than the folks who had the other kinds of family meetings. So little things we can do to make perhaps a difference. And I'm guessing you guys end up seeing some of the survivors maybe with complicated grief or other issues, maybe? Yes, okay. All right, so let the fa patients and families do most of the talking. What about dignity therapy or legacy work or whatever you wanna call it? It's essentially a, a brief individualized psychotherapy designed um, to address legacy work at end of life. Legacy work being, what is that? Well. Um, in the most recent study that just came out um, in May um, in Journal of Palliative Medicine, they sent um, individuals out to patients' homes um, who were on hospice. They sent uh, somebody who was uh, trained um, in trying to do this sort of legacy work. Um, and what did patients talk about? They talked about themselves. They talked about the people they loved, lessons learned in life, um, hopes and dreams, unfinished business. They gave sort of uh, messages and guidance to uh, survivors um, and talked about a whole bunch of things. In general, folks talked enough uh, to have about four sessions with these folks, totaling about 380 minutes or so um, in total. And in general, then, when this um, individual would then transcribe what had been told, it was about eight pages worth of loveliness that the patient could, again, either th therapeutically shred or pass on to loved ones. Um, and the individuals in the study uh, found it both helpful for them as the patients to do it, and they also, and the family members also found it helpful to have something um, afterwards. All right, what about advanced directives? Right, these are, um, you guys probably see these um, as much as I do, these dreaded things uh, that have legalese on them, that have one box checked, 
uh, maybe two. One that says, if I, I have no functioning brain cells, please let me die, which is brain death almost anyway, which means they're already dead, which means we wouldn't do anything differently. Um, it, you know, it's very uncommon for somebody to be that sick that most of those sort of generic advanced directives um, can be specific enough to be helpful. Um, and then they make some comment about feed me or don't feed me, and the current legal document for the state of Washington that's recommended is so dang confusing, it's got like a double, double negative in it. I do not want you to not feed me. It's, it's, it's the most confusing thing. Anyway, that's not the, I mean, that kind of advanced care planning would work, um, but I'd like to provide you with some other options. And uh, the rationale that I give um, is from Australia. If we could extrapolate that Australians are like us. Um, these folks, Dr. Karen Dettering and colleagues down in Australia, um, they picked on folks um, 80 years or older um, because they thought they might die. These were folks who were in the hospital, and they were randomized either to just having their hospital stay or having a trained nurse or allied professional come by and talk with them almost on the pusher model without the recommendation. I take that back. There was a recommendation. The recommendation was to do an advanced directive. Um, so they talked about understanding of illness, options, values, um, beliefs, wishes, these sorts of things. Encouraged them to define a surrogate decision maker and to speak to that person. It took about an hour of time to chat with them, um, and about 75% of the time, a surrogate was present for the discussion. During the discussions, 86% of the folks who received the intervention expressed wishes for their care and or designated a surrogate decision maker. Um, and 56 patients uh, died in the six-month follow-up period. And I think the thing that... Um, two things that were important. One, um, in folks who had the intervention arm, they had this hour long or so discussion with a trained individual. Uh, their wishes for end of life care were known more often and followed more often. So 86% of the time, uh, families or surrogate decision makers uh, knew what the wishes were and followed those wishes uh, compared to 30% of the time in the control folks. And then um, in my mind, more importantly, because um, survivors live oftentimes for a long time, and if they have a lot of um, uh, emotional baggage to carry for the years they have remaining, I think that's, that's a horrible tragedy. Um, so family members uh, who were in the intervention group had much less uh, stress based on, again, the impact of event scale um, to try to predict PTSD-type symptoms, less anxiety, sorry, less anxious symptoms, less depression-type symptoms, and we're more satisfied with the quality of the patient death. Um, so when my patients look at me and say, I don't want to do an advanced directive, I say, well, you do it for your loved ones because you might be helping them out um, in the long term. Is anybody familiar with the advanced directive called Five Wishes? So this is uh, sort of the touchy-feely version um, that is legal in our state, Washington, and in all the other blue states that are listed up there. It has nothing to do with their political affiliation. Um, it has a durable power of health care attorney portion um, and is in general designed uh, for patients to outline their wishes. It has five sections, um, as the five wishes suggest. The first section is essentially a durable power of health care attorney designation. Uh, the second one is essentially a code status or a pulsed form type discussion. Um, uh, if I can't think for myself, I want you to keep me on life support. If I can't talk, I want you to keep me on life support. Um, what's most important to me is that I can swim and run and bike and fish and take care of my alpacas. And if I can't do that, I want you to do this for my care or not do this for my care. So it's, it's more narrative than a, one of the sort of standard legal forms that we'll see that has a checkbox. Um, wish number three talks about comfort. Um, it addresses things like uh, touch me or don't touch me, hold my hand if I'm dying or don't you come near me. Um, there's one that talks about I'd like candles lit in my room or I want uh, music playing. Um, it addresses things like it's very important for me for uh, you to not spend a lot of money on me when I'm dying. I'd like the money to stay with you. So if it's a choice between money or me, keep the money, let me go, that sort of thing. So it's got all of these things that you wouldn't necessarily uh, want to bring up with your loved ones, but they're already written on the form and you cross off the ones you don't like and you circle the ones you do like and you edit them if you need to. So it brings up all of these issues and kind of says, look, there's a form, it was given to me by my doctor, we gotta talk about this. Finances, don't spend money on me. Or you better break the bank, there better not be a cent left. Um, these sorts of things. It talks about nursing homes and that sort of thing. 
Um, uh, I was incorrect. Uh, part four talks about how I want people to treat me. That's where the hand holding is. It's in four, um, and it talks about other things like I want people to come visit me and and, and other sorts of things. Um, and then what I want my loved ones to know are things like. Um, please play this at my funeral, or um, it's been really important for me to know Billy who lives in Nebraska, will you make sure and let him know that when I've died that I've gone and that sort of thing. Um, and the most common song that I've seen on these forms for their funeral? Born to run. Not born to run, but that would be great. <laughs> you would hope so, but no. Stairway to heaven. I'm like, oh, yes. And I don't even know what age group that is. What is that? Goodness gracious. All right. Um, pulsed forms. Does anybody who doesn't know what a pulsed form is? We all know what these are. No. Um, these are these are the step. Um, they're sort of slightly more touchy feely than the legal checkbox. Um, keep me on life support if I'm nearly dead sort of thing. Uh, this is um, a legal order in the state of Washington and many other states that says, if I'm dead, please try to bring me back to life or not. If I'm not dead but I'm struggling, I want to go to the hospital or I don't. Um, feed me if I can't eat myself or don't. Um, and then it has antibiotics on it too, lest the paramedics um, come running with a big syringe of penicillin. You can designate there what you'd like. All right, I have a couple minutes. I, Maybe you guys can help me understand this, okay? So language is important. The words we use are important. Um, and I worry most nights as I fall asleep that I have not been clear with patients and somehow I have mind tricked them into some decision. Um, so as a palliative care doctor, I have some beliefs that lead me to have chosen this profession, right? I don't think that people should be kept alive at all costs if that's not what they want. But I find myself spending a good chunk of my time trying to correct myself back to the middle because I worry about the language I might be using, forcing people to choose what I want them to choose. So help me figure this out. Dr. Valandez is a cinematographer. He like, has a master's or a PhD in cinema. And he's a physician. And he has um, videos that he's put together that have three different types of general care described. Life prolonging care, where he very matter of factly has a lovely woman who stands in a white coat and describes life prolonging care, including um, a very dignified gray haired physician in a white coat watching two people in blue scrubs coating a plastic person. The physician like person comes in, goes, and then walks out a little bit. It's very, it's, it's the calmest code you've ever seen. Um, but there's no blood squirting anywhere, nothing dramatic. It's all sort of very matter of fact. They talk about basic care. Um, they show a gentleman with an IV running, talk, you know, interacting with a nurse who's handing him a cup with some pills, um, and he sort of smiles a little bit. And then comfort care, where they show a gentleman with a handmade quilt pulled up to here, and he's sleeping in a bed. And they talk, it's very, the language to me seems very, very benign. It doesn't, it, but anyway. So Dr. Valandis has done several studies. Um, this one I show because I think it had the, the largest number of people, not huge numbers of studies. So 50 people who have malignant glioma, they receive, they, they listen to an individual essentially telling them a script about the three types of care they can choose. This is essentially a code discussion uh, sort of thing. Um, and then half of that group, after hearing the verbal thing, then here's exactly the same thing with this woman on the video. And you can see the folks who had the verbal discussion only, they say 26% of them said I'd like life prolonging care in the setting of my malignant glioma. Half of them said I'd like basic care. And about 20% said I'd like comfort care. The folks who went to saw the, see the video, look at this. 91% of them want comfort care. And I'm like, Jiminy, yes, are you going to tell me why this is? So, I mean, I guess I would, has he always used the same videos or have they changed the, the settings? I mean, the, the, what you described about the videos doesn't seem like there is a level of standardization between the different groups. So I could imagine that I might, if, if I didn't see any medical intervention, I just saw a comfortable man sleeping under a quilt, that that might be a powerful image. Yes. 
The, um, the only other thing that goes through all three of them is um, a general statement that folks with um, incurable cancer, which a malignant glioma is, um, uh, don't generally do well with, and I can't, they don't use aggressive, there's another term they use, um, care. So that theme runs through, but they see, and they see all three pictures. So they don't just see life prolonged basic care, comfort care. They all see all three. I guess what I'm wondering is if I would like to, I would want to refilm it with different types of images. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. Different saliences to the three different kinds yes. of images and see if that number changes because it, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't take it, take away from things, but it, yeah, it suggests that there's some saliency between the three different video images of the, of the different treatment groups. Yes. I, I agree entirely. Yes. I'd like to, to know the, the, the uh, age range group ah. and, and uh, plug the ages and make correlations with things. Right. I apologize. I cannot recall the ages. Yeah. Okay. That they, they um, you know, sort of table one in all of these studies where they talk about the demographics of the patients, they were, they were no different between the group randomized to verbal versus verbal plus video, but I, I can't, t I, I don't recall whether you know, the, the average age was 26 or 86. But they were the same for each group in general, statistically anyway, although small sample size. So I think your point is well taken because he shows these same videos and then does different groups. So he's got a congestive heart failure group, he's got a dementia group, he's got a whole bunch of groups, but he's using the same video. Um, so you could Google Dr. Valandas, volunteer to shoot some different videos because I, I, my goal in life is not to make everybody choose comfort care. That's not the right thing to do. But if really we're giving people such bad information that by simply showing them like a five minute video, we can change their opinion about something that's so important so drastically, it, it just makes me very nervous that what the heck are we doing and, and what's the best way to do this? All right, Handbook for Mor Mortals is something I recommend for um, patients if you might be seeing them for other reasons, but they're struggling. Uh, it talks about how to talk with your doctor and um, perhaps considering things that might be more important to you than what your doctor um, thinks is important to you. All right, and then my very quick soapbox, which I'll go through in 30 seconds, um, is letters of condolence. Does anybody write letters of condolence? You guys don't lose very many people in psychiatry, hopefully. You do? I'm a geriatric so I have older patients. There you go. Um, have you found it to be oh, helpful? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. For you, for the patient's oh, families, both. both. Yeah. Um, I think uh, very little research. We're starting something up at the, the university to try to see if we can get some decent data. Um, but if you're interested in writing one and don't know what to say, if you were to go to PubMed and, Med and put in uh, New England Journal of Medicine and Letter of Condolence, um, there's an article from 2001 that has almost an embarrassingly cookbook way of doing it just to sort of get you started until you have a way of doing it yourself. All right, and then the last thing I'll leave you with is if you're wondering about the minds of the palliative care providers um, in the United States um, and what we might do for treating depression or some of these things that you guys are much, much better at treating than we are, um, and you're wondering why you're seeing a patient that we're seeing with you and we're giving methylphenidate for depression or something of that nature, um, the, if you uh, were to Google or use your favorite search engine and put in palliative care and fast facts, we need something quickly, um, these are one-page little peer-reviewed things that sort of say this is what the palliative care community in general um, is doing about um, depression or uh, difficult to control delirium or palliative sedation or those sorts of things where we sort of interface with you guys a little more often than otherwise. Alrighty, um, and I did not leave any time for questions, but hopefully we got some of them um, as we were going through. Um, I'm happy to stay and take questions if people have time. Otherwise, thank you very much for inviting me. And for <laughs> Thank you, Sharon.